Hi, my name is Allison Newman. I'm at the University of Washington Addictions, Drug and Alcohol Institute. Um, thank you so much for being here today for our webinar, Harm Reduction 101, from yesterday to today. Our presenters today are Emily Hirio and Lupe Hurtado. I'm super excited to have you all here. Um, just a few webinar logistics. This is um, a Zoom webinar, which means only panelists and hosts can share video and audio. Please enter your comments and questions in the chat and Q&A. Um, those should be enabled and it should be so that um, you all can also see people's questions and respond to them. So, you know, if you know a lot about this topic already and someone has a question, feel free to, to enter that. And I think most importantly, be respectful and be curious. So I am gonna hand it off to my wonderful colleague, Emily. Um, she is gonna talk about the history of harm reduction theory and key principles. Emily is with the Washington Department of Health and someone I work with regularly and really appreciate and enjoy. So thanks Emily so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Allison, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, I am uh, at the Department of Health, as Allison mentioned. I uh, work in the Office of Infectious Disease and manage uh, sub, uh, several teams focused on hepatitis C, uh, drug user health, and integrated infectious disease testing, and that's HIV, STI, and hepatitis testing. Um, our drug user health team, I just to give a quick overview, um, we provide harm reduction subject matter expertise um, to sister agencies, as well as within the department. Um, we work closely with the healthcare authority on um, statewide planning efforts um, that address care and coordination um, and harm reduction services for people who use drugs. We're involved with the state opioid and overdose response plan. Um, and we coordinate some partner engagement and mobilization efforts aimed at improving systems um, to serve people who use drugs. We also work with if not all, most of the syringe service programs in the state um, through uh, in-kind uh, supply clearinghouse that we offer. Um, also, many programs have contracts with our office and we provide uh, capacity building support and, uh, uh, and technical assistance and training. Um, and then we also uh, coordinate the statewide overdose education and naloxone distribution program and support agencies that want to distribute naloxone um, to community members and particularly the people most likely to witness and respond to opioid overdose, which are people who use drugs and their friends and family. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some context for harm reduction in the United States. Um, and uh, I like to start with thinking about why some drugs are legal and others are illegal. Um, and uh, really, you know, many illegal drugs um, have been used for thousands of years. Um, things like opium, cocoa, psychedelics, and cannabis, which I know is now legal in Washington and many other states, but wasn't until recently. Um, have been made illegal and their legal status is not based on any scientific assessment of their relative risks. Um, it has everything to do with who is associated with these drugs. Uh, so the first uh, anti-narcotic law in the United States was an ordinance in San Francisco in 1875 that, was, that banned opium smoking and opium dens. It did not mention other forms of opium such as opium tonics or, uh, or uh, other formulations. So it was very specifically criminalizing the Chinese community in San Francisco to uh, use opium through smoking and had sort of uh, places called opium dens that uh, where consumption took place. And this really played on unfounded and racist fears um, that Chinese men were going to use opium to seduce white women. And although white women constituted the majority of opium users through the use of patented over-the-counter medicines, um, the law was specifically targeted um, at this community and framed in a way that was um, very much uh, an effort to undermine Chinese men and the Chinese community broadly. Next slide. Uh, 
And uh, the first anti-cocaine laws <clears throat> uh, started in the early 1900s in Southern states, and they were really directed at Black men, played on racist tropes. The New York Times had a headline, Negro Cocaine Fiends in 1914. And the idea um, behind this trope was that Black men were inciting violence, attacking white women, and, and somehow using cocaine made them resistant to fatal wounds. And uh, this might resonate if you are of my age. There was a lot of conversation about PCP making people superhuman and that they uh, could resist uh, arrest and uh, battle through this. There's no basis in science for these things, but these are sort of the messages that have propagated. And you'll also see this sort of theme uh, using white women and the fear of attack against white women as a way to undermine uh, communities. So you see that used a lot. Um, and the first anti-cannabis laws um, shortly thereafter in the 1910s and 1920s directed at Mexican migrants and Mexican Americans uh, really founded in a fear of immigration after the Mexican Revolution and a lot of framing as the marijuana menace. So really a, a, a thread you can see in these early drug anti-drug laws uh, that were really targeting um, specific uh, racial and ethnic communities and based on xenophobic and racist fears. Next slide. So I should say I'm giving a very quick and dirty uh, historical perspective on some of our, our early policy responses to drugs. This is by far uh, just the surface. There's a lot more to this. So if everyone, anyone sort of is thinking I'm oversimplifying this, um, I am, but it's for lack of lack of time. And there's a lot of reading um, and information on this that's fascinating. Um, I am jumping ahead several decades to the 70s when uh, President Nixon declared a war on drugs. Uh, he dramatically increased the size and the presence of federal drug control agencies and pushed through measures such as mandatory minimum sentencing and no-knock warrants. And if you're paying attention to the news in the last several years, no-knock warrant is what was used um, in the situation of the murder of Breonna Taylor. Um, uh, and uh, there are a lot of criticisms of no-knock warrants um, and mandatory minimum sentencing. Uh, but that really those measures were really pushed through and enhanced during this period um, of the start of the quote unquote war on drugs. Um, Nixon temporarily placed marijuana, or I should say cannabis in schedule one, which is the most restrictive category of drugs pending review by a commission that he appointed. And then the commission unanimously recommended decriminalizing the possession and distribution of cannabis for personal use, but Nixon ignored the report and rejected the recommendation. So again, you can see sort of an anti-science uh, thread. And uh, one of his top aides, John Ehrlichman, uh, he, he claims that he didn't say this, but there's a, a journalist who recorded this and put this in a book um, and confirms that he did say it. Um, and this quote is, uh, you wanna know what this, really, what this was really all about and what this is, is the war on drugs. Um, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Next slide. So I'm not going to show this video, but I do highly recommend it's short, uh, less than four minutes uh, from the Drug Policy Alliance. And it's a history of the war on drugs um, from Prohibition Rush. And it's narrated by Jay-Z and has these really great illustrations um, by Molly Crabapple. So if you get a chance to watch it, it talks a bit about uh, a perspective on New York, some of the New York state uh, laws in, in particular, um, also around um, the response to cannabis and cannabis legalization and sort of who that's benefited and who that hasn't benefited. Um, so just a recommendation to watch uh, at your leisure after the webinar. And just to note also, it has some of the information is a little out of date, but I think still very relevant. So why, why I think this sort of historical lens is important is that we have to recognize the racist and xenophobic foundation on which US drug policy has been built. 
so that we know how that impacts people's health and the response to people who use drugs, how we build health equity. Um, so, uh, you know, our history is our present. Um, and so understanding that I think is really critical. And, you know, a lot of our current drug policy is not so different from where we started. It's built on the same foundation. Um, in terms of uh, what guides our work as well, thinking about harm reduction, uh, not just in relationship to drug use, but also sexual health. And that um, kind of sex positivity is sort of the sexual health friend of harm reduction. Um, thinking about things being safe, consensual, and informed. Um, we really frame uh, the work as non-judgmental, anti-criminalization, and addressing stigma and shame. And I know Lupe will talk a little bit about language, but using things like person-first language, for example. Um, and then you may hear harm reduction framed as any positive change. Um, it's any positive change as defined by the person making that change. Um, and I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think this idea of any positive change as defined by the person making that change, both were sort of popularized by Dan Big, who's a real hero um, of overdose response and the harm reduction movement. He really helped popularize naloxone distribution to community members in the US. Um, and Dave Purchase, who uh, founded the Tacoma Needle Exchange, which was the first government supported uh, syringe service program in the country here in Tacoma. So I think they really, Dan said any positive change. And then I think Dave added this as defined by the person making the change. Um, you'll also hear harm reduction framed as meeting people where they are. And then a new addition is really, but don't leave them there, really help guide people, support people along a path to um, better health, wellness, and whatever positive changes they identify. Next slide. So um, this is really some principles of harm reduction that come from the Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, and I just, I'm not gonna read this whole slide to you, there's a link, but just to note, there's sort of two ways we can think about harm reduction. One is around a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. Um, the other is sort of as a movement for social justice that's really built on a belief in and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. So I'll talk a little bit more about, about the difference and similarity between those two ideas. Next slide. Um, again, principles, uh, one that I wanted to highlight, I'm not going to read all of these, but or two that I want to highlight. One is that really harm reduction is about accepting for better or worse, that licit meaning legal and Ill illicit meaning illegal drug use is part of our world and choosing to work to minimize its harmful effects rather than simply ignoring or condemning uh condemning drug use. And then the other I wanted to, or the, the other two is affirming people who use drugs themselves as the primary agents of reducing um, that uh, people who use drugs uh, share need to uh, share information and support each other um, and that they're the real agents of change. Um, and then recognizing the realities of poverty, class, racism, uh, social trauma, uh, I'm sorry, social isolation, trauma, sex-based discrimination, and other social inequalities, that these things affect both people's vulnerability to drug-related harm, but also their capacity for effectively dealing with drug-related harm. So just, uh, you know, you can read all of, these are all really amazing principles, um, but wanted to highlight a few. Next slide. And Emily, I see one question I'm just going to yeah. jump in with um, sure. from Madeline. How would you discuss the topic of a racist drug policy foundation with people who may currently have racist ideologies and may be defensive about this issue? I think that's a good sort of clarifying Ooh, question. That's a really good question. Um, I guess I would interrogate with them that question of why some drugs are legal and some are illegal and ask them to think about that. Um, and when we think about legal drugs, such as to, you know, nicotine, tobacco, um, alcohol, are we basing the, the, their legality on their relative risk to health versus other drugs or, uh, or something different? Um, because when you start to interrogate, um, just opiates generally are not particularly dangerous if regulated um, used uh, according to regulated instruction. 
Um, what makes them dangerous is the context of criminalization, unregulation, not knowing what's in your drug supply, um, uh, an a unregulated market that's very uncertain. So I think I would maybe ask some questions, but I would love to see what people put in the chat because that is a really big question and really um, important. And, you know, I having worked in direct service, but it's been a long time, certainly had to work with folks who came with very bigoted um, attitudes to our programs. And, you know, we still wanted to meet them where they were and provide them service. Um, and it can be a real challenge. So great question. Uh, all right. So uh, what I did want to give a little attention to is what um, the Harm Reduction Coalition sort of frames as big H, big R harm reduction versus little H, little R harm reduction. And then this sort of third idea of risk reduction. And to frame this up very quickly, I've noticed there's a lot of cognitive dissonance about um, which kind of quote unquote harm reduction is okay and what which isn't. Um, some of that is sort of my drug use is okay, but this other kind of drug use is not okay. So my wine drinking at night, my coffee drinking in the morning, um, my going to the dispensary for gummies or whatever those things may be, those are okay. But um, uh, taking that fentanyl pill snorting cocaine, using ecstasy, those are not okay. And so there's some cognitive dissonance there. And some of that may be based on sort of our ideas of, and our, you know, um, sort of non in, unconscious bias around who's using these drugs, how they're using them, uh, race and class issues. Um, the other cognitive dissonance I've been noticing a lot of is uh, it's, it's okay to provide naloxone and fentanyl test strips but it's not okay to provide uh, glassware pipes or syringes. Um, sort of, it's okay to provide naloxone and fentanyl test strips. These are things not involved in the actual process of consuming drugs. But when we're talking about supplies that would actually be used in the consumption of drugs process, uh, some people get really uncomfortable. Um, and so I've just, I'm, I'm just noticing this cognitive dissonance. I'm actually thinking, is there like an article I could write about this? Cause I find it very interesting. Um, but I, I frame this as I talk about big H, big R harm reduction and little H, little R harm reduction to say that big H, big R harm reduction is really that philosophical and political movement. It's focused on shifting power and resources to people who are most vulnerable to structural violence. So it's really around giving power to people who use drugs, letting them lead, help them, letting them design programs and lead those programs, um, giving folks agency voice and that recognition that the change agents are the people most affected by the issues. Little h, little r harm reduction, I think is what most of us are familiar with, which is really around a fundamental approach and belief to how to provide services to people who use drugs. So really not being judgmental, um, really helping meet people where they are, but not leaving them there, supporting people on a path to any positive change as they define it. What I am seeing a lot of what's being called harm reduction, but is actual risk reduction, is when we're just providing tools and services to reduce potential harm. And so an example is a naloxone vending machine um, is great, or passing out safer drug use supplies. Those are great tasks and activities and ways that help people reduce risk. They may not necessarily be harm reduction activities. If they're not grounded in an approach and a fund fundamental belief in how to provide those services in an equitable person first um, empowering way, then they may be risk reduction services. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot of. And I, I hope that distinction is, is makes sense. Um, but just sort of handing people supplies is a great risk reduction activity. But if it's not coming with client-centered education partnership, conversation, engagement, um, then it's it may not necessarily be a harm reduction activity. Next slide. Emily, are there any final wrap up that, kind of comments? I blew, I got through that in the time I wanted to. Um, no, Good I just, job. I think Lupe will really take you all to the kind of the next piece of this, which is really the practical. I sort of sat in the theoretical 
Um, and so I'm excited to learn from Lupe and hear what she has to say, um, and then happy to answer questions at the end. So thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. Thank and you, I'm, Emily. I'm gonna hand it over to Lupe Hurtado with the Downtown Emergency Services Center. I really enjoyed getting to know Lupe, putting these together, and I'm so appreciative that um, you're able to be here with us today. Thank you, thank you, Austin, and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lupe Hurtado. Um, I'm a peer counselor at the D at DESC, Downtown Emergency Services Center. And I work with OTN, which is the Opioid Treatment Network. Um, we provide MOUD to people um, who, who wanna make a change to their drug use or people who just wanna mitigate um, withdrawal symptoms. I've also worked at the Tacoma Needle Exchange, which um, Emily mentioned uh, as a community health outreach worker. I've, uh, I sit on the anti-stigma committee with the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department and I volunteer with the key project. So I'm gonna be talking about harm reduction in practice today. Um, so next slide. So after what Emily talked about and while I'm talking, I, I want you all to think about what does harm reduction mean to you? Um, have you practiced harm reduction? And what does it look like to mitigate harms? I want you to think about how can you compassionately support someone in their lifestyle, even if they are causing harm to themselves? Next slide. So I'm a person with lived experience um, and I can really relate to this, this picture in this slide, the harm reduction saved my life. Um, I've had experiences over the years with people, family members, courts, treatment centers, um, requiring abstinence of me and I never had the recovery that other people expected. Harm reduction made me feel seen and heard for the person I am and not for my drug use. And when we put conditions and demands on people, we failed them from the beginning. Harm reduction understands that abstinence is not for everyone. And in a journal of addiction medicine study estimated that 2.2% of individuals with OUD will experience one in five years of abstinence in their life. So why is success in recovery measured by abstinence when it isn't a reality? for 97.8% of us. Um, would you have a surgery if the success rate was 2.2%? You know, uh, would you have the surgery if, if your job was dependent on it, if your housing was dependent on it and your freedom? So harm reduction provides an empowering approach that in equity to people who use drugs. Next slide. So harm reduction mindset, how do we implement the harm reduction principles in our encounters? Um, how do we meet people where they're at? It's important to, to support people in, in safe drug use, but also to provide low barrier services. So remove requirements from services, provide trauma-informed care, and flexible structures at your organization with where and how you meet people who use drugs. Um, so mobile services and outreach. Um, and it's important that we remind ourselves that the work we do is for the people we serve and not for us. Um, and to use person-centered language, which I will talk about in the next slide. So people who use drugs are stigmatized in so many different ways. And these negative attitudes, beliefs, and stereotypes cause harm to people and keep them isolated and vulnerable. Um, stigma keeps people from asking for help or accessing services. And we need to remember that our words drive our thoughts, our actions, and our behaviors. And eradicating stigma requires new language that re recognizes and validates individual over experiences over 
um, their lifestyle, their behavior, a medical diagnosis that they live with. And so we put the person first. Um, instead of saying a homeless person, we, we always say a person experiencing homelessness or someone who's living unhoused. Um, to, to confront stigma, we have to call it out when we hear it. Um, call it out in your daily life and, and people that are around you um, and educate people on the harm that stigma causes. Okay, next slide. So there aren't safeguards in society to empower and support people to use drugs without punitive measures. Um, and these punitive measures usually bring about deeper harms of drug use, a loss of freedom, loss of status, um, and social network. So drug user unions, um, so that's big H, big R, like Emily talked about. They're collectives of people who use drugs, harm reductionists, people with lived experience who take action to support the rights of people who use drugs, demand equity, advocate for social, ja or social justice, and bring about, uh, bring about awareness of harm reduction movement. So some of the things that drug user unions advocate for are um, the deregulation of the methadone structure, which has traditionally been very punitive. Um, advocacy about safe supply um, and safe consumption sites. Policy change um, to support the health and, and wellness of people who use drugs. And bringing back to those harm reduction principles, we focus on person-centered goals. Like Emily said, change is defined by the person changing and progress is determined by the expert, which is the individual. Um, listen to what people have to say, listen to what they've lost in their lives, listen to what they want their life to look like um, and create a, a space where they feel seen and understood. Next slide. So living unhoused is a truly traumatic, isolating and home hopeless experience. Trying to get your needs met every day, trying to survive constantly with being exposed to victimization, discrimina discrimination, assault, arrest, and death. So meeting people where they're at is not the same thing as showing up where they are. It's about meeting people at their level and helping them overcome their barriers. Um, outreach and mobile sites overcome the barrier of um, isolation and transportation, um, going to where people are and bringing what they need, providing hygiene supplies, wound care supplies, syringes, pipes, offering medical and dental services, um, community resource navigation, um, advocacy for safety and stability for individuals living unhoused. So when I say that, I mean, you know, be present at encampment sweeps. Encampment sweeps inhibit people's ability to connect with community, access resources, build stability and establish belongings. Be present and hold city officials and law enforcement accountable for the structural violence that they're participating in. Um, housing first model. So at DESC, we have the housing first model, which the housing first model is about providing stable and permanent housing as the first and primary intervention um, to people experiencing homelessness, regardless of their mental health, substance use, or other challenges. Next slide. So individuals in the commercial sex trade face constant threat of sex-based violence police persecution and murder. And the harm reduction movement has always included further, furthering the rights and legitimacy and safety for people who engage in sex work. Some examples of this are special medical um, services. So access to sexual health clinics, access to contraceptives, to PrEP, 
testing for HIV, Hep C, and STIs, um, bad date lists. Uh, when I used to work, I used the bad date list. It's an online or um, publication of incidents where people who have engaged in sex work were violated, assaulted, um, robbed, and it's a way to, to keep yourself aware of your surroundings um, and build a community of people who, who are looking out for sex workers. Um, safety planning, engage with people about how they work, where are they working, are they working on the street, are they online, are they, do they have a pimp, are they working alone or with someone else? Um, community support groups, self-defense classes, as well as legal support um, for the protections, for, for protection of the rights of sex workers. Next slide. So current narratives around harm reduction perspectives and, and experiences are often from white people about white communities. And this leaves out, this excludes the works of, of uh, black harm reductionists, people who use drugs. Um, and it excludes also the harms of racist drug and criminal legal healthcare policies, um, which exasperate racial disparities. So even we hear about the fentanyl epidemic this, this is also, we also see a lot of images of white people and white people's experience, but this leaves out a big portion. From 2015 to 2020, the black men, or the rate of black men dying from opioid overdose increased by 213%. And this needs to be talked about. Um, BIPOC, harm reduction centers racial equity around the harm reduction framework. And this includes undoing the harms of colonialism, which place indigenous people, First Nations, Matisse, and Inuit at higher risk of harmful substance use. So I'm gonna play a little clip of this video um, where uh, a woman is talking about how she brings her culture into um, implementing harm reduction in her community. When we talk about people's healing journey, I mean moving forward. I don't mean reducing their drug use. I don't mean stopping drug use. I mean engaging in culture and, and building the relationship with self and getting to know yourself through here. Gaila Kassala Nuga Am Clackwell, Nuga Am Marni Scow. My traditional name is Clackwell, which means copper breaking woman. It was a name that was given to me from my grandmother uh, from the Heltzik Nation up in Bella Bella. Um, my English name is Marnie Scow, and I was born and raised uh, in Port Hardy on Vancouver Island. I am registered to the Quagilf Nation. I try to keep culture at the center of my approach to harm reduction. I believe that low barrier and no barrier access to culture really makes a huge difference. When I talk about people who are actively using substance, quite often we are pushed to the margins of society and we're kind of walking along the outskirts and when we're forced into isolation or don't have access to basic necessities or things like culture um, we can often fall down a hill and it's so hard to get back up so for me i believe that everybody should have access to traditional land-based healing to smudging to prayer to drumming they should be able to be around it regardless of their relationship with substance being like you can't come here because you're using drugs is very difficult for people because it's like you're taking away their identity. Name's Kaliok Sedgmore and I'm from Kwakwakiok Namgis territory. Um, use they them pronouns and my main title is just working as a peer supervisor at the um, overdose prevention sites. It's a very difficult thing to be a drug user in culture and ceremonies and stuff like that because it's you get called out on it, you get shamed for it. So by providing harm reduction, it just will show you that. You can participate in these ceremonies without being ashamed of it. Galakasla, Nugo Am Gemachalas. 
Lupe, was that the clip you wanted me yeah, to show? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, thank what you. a great video, though. I watched the whole thing and recommend other people do as well. Yes, please, please check that out. I, I have a link in, in, um, in the end of my slides. Okay, next slide. So syringe service programs, traditionally called needle exchanges, um, have been around since the late 80s, early 90s in response to the increased rate of HIV AIDS through IV drug use and sex. So needle exchanges have been proven effective in reducing the spread of bloodborne disease, promoting safer injection practices, connecting with people who use drugs, um, and providing access to social and healthcare services. They play a critical role in providing, um, distributing supplies and educating on the health and wellness of participants, people who use drugs. So needle exchanges distribute syringes, pipes, um, everything that goes along with um, IV drug use, cottons, cookers, ties, sharps containers, as well as naloxone and Narcan. Um, pipes are becoming more popular. The, traditionally, it was just syringes, but as we're seeing a lot more people smoking, um, that's being provided. Um, so bubbles, hammers, stems, and foil. So wound care supplies um, are, are given to help stop the spread of SSTIs, soft skin and tissue infections, um, or any other in, injection infections. Um, they also provide access to um, referrals and testing for HIV and Hep C, as well as treatment. Um, they have um, referrals for medication for opioid use disorder, so Suboxone, Methadone, Sublocade, Vivitrol. These medications help people um, mitigate the harm of, of their use, manage withdrawal symptoms. Um, at the OTN where I work, I mean, there's people who have completely stopped using fentanyl. There's people that use Suboxone just to get through withdrawal symptoms when they don't have anything. You know, any, any of those goals are, are totally acceptable and 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 um, medication for opioid use disorders help people. Vein care, so choosing the right size and gauge. Um, syringe service programs help educate people about, um, you know, vein care practices. So how to find a vein, no, knowing what's a vein and what's an artery, how to tie off. Um, you know, strategies about avoiding sharing um, equipment and using a new point for every shot. Syringe service programs also provide overdose prevention education and community trainings, um, as well as resource navigation. One-to-one -one model at a syringe exchange is the traditional original um, model where what you what the amount of syringes you bring back is what you get back in return. Um, the needs based model is more of a be best practice model. Um, whatever someone asks for is what they need, and that's what they get regardless if they have anything to return. Um, if, if funding allows, that's the best best um, best model for people who use drugs. Next slide. Encourage naloxone and Narcan to everyone, participants, people who use drugs, community members, um, and, and educate people about naloxone and overdose prevention. Make sure people know about the signs of an opioid overdose and the risk factors. Some risk factors include, you know, if a person has left jail or treatment or from a hospital stay, their tolerance has dropped and that puts them at risk for overdose, as well as um, if you have experienced one overdose, you're twice as likely to experience another one. Um, 
synergy, make sure people know about poly substance use and mixing different substances. Educate people on how to administer naloxone and Narcan. Um, make sure they know about rescue breaths. That's vitally important. When someone's in an opioid overdose, they are not breathing for themselves. Make sure people know that the breath is, is very important. Call 911, making sure that EMS has been alerted. But also I tell people when you're calling 911, say that someone's not breathing. You don't necessarily have to say someone's overdosing. You know, stigma, like I talked about, is comes from every place, even, you know, um, from emergency services. So say someone's not breathing and you need help now. Um, also, I, I want to talk about, you know, traditionally, we always tell people not to use alone. But realistically, people use alone all the time. And I think it's important that we promote safer use even when using alone and not just tell people to use, not use alone because they do. Um, some, some things that you can suggest to people is call the Never Use Alone hotline or use the Brave app. The Brave app is like a virtual consumption site. A person can use the Brave app and it connects them to a supporter. Um, the rest, a person can put their rescue plan. So if, if I don't respond or the line goes dead, call my friend, they have Narcan, this is their number. Or if that, if that doesn't happen, the supporter will dispatch to 911. Um, and make sure everyone at your organization knows how to use Narcan and has Narcan available. Next slide. How do we engage with people who use dr drugs to create relationships that empower them and build resiliency and report? Rapport. So take every opportunity to educate. Um, engagement is about education, building those relationships um, and building that trust. Transparency, be clear about people's choices. Don't try to leverage things, please be, be honest and be clear so people can make the right decision for themselves. Provide trauma-informed care, um, recognize the, the symptoms and signs of trauma expression and provide a safe space for people to, to talk about things that have happened to them. Also, you can use the con the risk set setting model. Traditionally in treatment um, structures, it's been called drug set setting, but in harm reduction, we know people are using drugs and that's that's not the concern. It's the risk of, of everything that can come with that. So the risk is what is the harm or issue being presented and how does this correlate with behavior? Is this person at risk for overdose? Set, we talk about a person's mindset. What's, what thoughts are they bringing into this situation? Um, how are they feeling? Have they gotten their needs met today? Ha have they eaten? Have they slept? Have they gotten rest? Um, and setting is, a, is about their surroundings, their physical environment and where they are. Who is around them? Are they at a shelter? Are they at an encampment? Are they at their house? Are police present? Are community members present? Is an abusive boyfriend present? Is someone who owes them money present? So thinking about that helps us deliver harm reduction and improve engagement with our clients and the people we serve. Next slide. So I put this, this is the effects of little h, little r harm reduction strategies. So like I talked about before, um, providing stale syringes re reduces the transmission of HIV and 
hepatitis C, as well as other bloodborne infections, um, reduces the rate of SSTIs, reduces um, visits to the emergency room. Um, Narcan and naloxone helps people uh, respond to opioid overdoses and save people's lives. Um, engagement helps reduce stigma um, that people who have used drugs experience and um, build supportive relationships built on trust that improves the quality of care and well-being. But on a bigger scale, um, harm reduction promotes health and wellness for, for all of the whole community. Um, and it shifts focus from punitive me measures to public health strategies fosters a more compassionate and realistic approach to the harms associated with drug use and acknowledges that abstinence may not be desired or achievable for everyone. And it strives to dismantle and eradicate stigma. Next slide. And this, these are some pictures of me. Um, uh, working in harm reduction services. So on the left, that is me at uh, the G Street encampment um, in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and then on the right, that's me and Allie from uh, Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. We're at a community fair shooting and teaching people about naloxone and opioid overdose. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Lupe. Um, I'm gonna go over a few resources that we've all compiled and then um, please put questions in the chat or a Q&A. So Lupe was uh, wonderful enough to put all of her resources on these slides. And then I have a few others for like further reading. Um, different organizations are like the Washington State Syringe Services Programs Directory. So if you want to find a program near you, that's an option. Um, other groups are the Harm Reduction Coalition and Dread Policy Alliance have web pages, including stopoverdose.org, which I work on, and the Washington Department of Health Overdose Education and Naloxone Distribution webpage. And then a whole bunch of podcasts, which thanks to my colleague Mandy Sladke for finding some of these. Um, this week on Criminal, they had this episode, The Liverpool Exchange, which is the story of the first needle exchange in the UK. Um, and they interview Maya Salovitz, who is then, you know, listed in two of the books we have. Um, she writes really wonderfully about the history of harm reduction. Um, Chasing the Scream by Johan Hari talks about the history and impact of the war on drugs. And for a really nice language guide, um, we've linked to the Anti-Stigma Language Guide from Tacoma Pierce County Opioid Task Force. And this is not an exclusive list of all the harm reduction resources. This is what we could think of. So I have one question I want to go back to that um, Emily answered in the chat, but Lupe, I'm curious how you would respond. Um, given that we don't define success and recovery as abstinence, how do you find define success and recovery in this framework? Um, I think that recovery is defined by a transformation, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be tied with someone's use, you know, it, it's about making your life how you want it to be. Um, it's about addressing your health. This is, this is how it is for me, you know, um, I, I still use drugs. You know, I take Suboxone every day, um, but I also, you know, give back to my community. That's part of, of my recovery too, is, is being there for people who are still suffering. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's what the person, whoever is defining their recovery, that is what their recovery is. I think that's a really great response and I appreciate you. Uh, personalizing it and sharing that. Um, we have a question. Besides carrying Narcan, what can an individual do to further support harm reduction in their immediate community? And Emily or Lupe, either of you can take this. Well, I guess I would say 
carrying naloxone is a great risk reduction activity. Um, I think in order to really make it a harm reduction activity, it might be engaging with community members about them also carrying naloxone, having conversation, but really about building relationship um, and trying to um, unwind um, a lot of the bias we all have around drug use and people who use drugs. Um, and I'll send this to you, Allison, but I just remembered I have a picture of um, Edith Springer was sort of the, I don't know, some people call her, I'm not going to call her the grandmother because I don't know if she would like that, but she's definitely the godmother of harm reduction in the United States. And if you read Undoing Drugs by Maya Salavitz, Edith Springer is featured very prominently in that book. Um, but she wrote a harm reduction workers best practices handout in 1996. And um, I just kind of pulled it up because I had forgotten what a great resource this was. Um, but uh, really the idea here around harm reduction is that behavior change is complicated and it's a process that happens over time. And the key is to develop a relationship with people. And Tim Candela on my team often says the relationship is the intervention. So I'm gonna channel Tim. But I would say that's things we can do in our community is build relationships. And that could be building relationships with people who are very pro war on drugs to try to help unpack that and maybe maybe move them along a stage of change. It could be building relationship with people who use drugs who need support and uh, and love. Um, so I think I think sort of thinking beyond just sort of the supplies and the things that can be handed out that certainly are super helpful and often life-saving, right? Um, but what are the what are the relationships we can build in our communities that can really um, undo some of the things, some of our response to drugs that isn't promoting public health, that is actually maybe doing more harm than good. Um, and that's kind of what I would say to that. Lupe, is there anything you would add? Um, I mean, I agree with what Emily said, um, you know, like call out stigma. You, we hear it all the time, address it and educate people. Um, you know, I, I think there, there's a lot of organizations and agencies in the community that would love the support and, you know, volunteering of, of, of other community members, um, you know, but I also think maybe just outside of just people using drugs, think about the other people, other populations that I talked about in the harm reduction and, and um, promoting social justice, you know, for, for a BIPOC community, um, supporting the rights and legitimacy for people who engage in sex work, um, all of these things. I, I think, of course, carrying naloxone is important um, but may maybe go out and give it out to people and start talking them to them and also making sure that people know how to use it. I think those are uh, really good points and I appreciate it. And I see that Chelsea has put in the chat that Filter Magazine called Edith Springer the goddess of harm reduction. Um, and we have a question from Brittany. Are there any good resources that any of you know of to better educate people on the difference between harm reduction and risk reduction? The distinction between the two terms feels really important. So if you go to harmreduction.org to the National Harm Reduction Coalition's website, they I, there's kind of more on that. So I would suggest that as a good resource. I think for me, and I'd be curious, Lupe, what you think. Um, the distinction is risk reduction is just sort of providing supplies and sort of one-way information to folks. Um, risk, uh, so that would be risk reduction. Harm, re harm reduction is really, you may still be providing those supplies and some one-way information, but it's really about the relationships. It's about the, the, the stance um, of the folks providing those services and the attitude and the um, kind of really putting participants in the driver's seat, um, really understanding that people may have a lot of feelings of ambivalence about their drug use or their sex work or whatever other things are going on in their lives. Um, and that that ambivalence isn't resistance. It's mm -hmm. just it's just ambivalence, right? We all of us experience it. 
Um, and so really listening to people um, being a resource and not directive. And so I, to me, that's the real distinction is one is sort of a one way I'm handing you supplies and information, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but that is really risk reduction, not harm reduction. And Brittany yeah. said, thank you. That is helpful. In my setting, I often hear people reference harm reduction when in reality they are talking about risk reduction. And Lupe, what would you add? I, I think also just like bringing all yeah. those um, harm reduction principles into your interactions, into your daily life. I mean, it, it's it's important to re really look inside yourself, first of all, and, you know, think about things that you've heard or things that you've been through and, and kind of work through that and make sure that you, you think about, like, how has stigma played a role in my life? And I, I feel like that, in a sense, helps people, you know, connect and engage with people who use drugs better. Um, start thinking about it in your own life. And then you'll be able to reflect that in your relationships and, um, and with the people that you serve. I think that's a really great response. Um... And Brittany, if you want to, you can type in what your setting is, but you don't have to. Um, I know where you work, but um, I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has questions, any final questions? I guess I'll give it a second in case people are typing. I do just wanna say thank you so much, Lupe and Emily for doing this webinar. I learned so much, really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and experience and all these wonderful resources and all these different examples of harm reduction and what it looks like in theory and practice. So um, all I see so far is this was great. Thank you. So that's not a question, but a really nice comment. Um, any other questions that people have for presenters? All right, and I'll just put in a plug. Um, Emily, if you do want to learn more about harm reduction or if your agency wants to learn more about harm reduction, uh, Emily's team has some great resources. And um, Lupe is a pretty wonderful presenter. So um, just throwing out there, there are a lot of great people and organizations who can provide training on harm reduction. And I really um, think it's best to connect with organizations that are doing that work directly. Um, such as syringe services programs or people doing direct service or groups like Emily's at the Washington Department of Health who are working, you know, with syringe services programs. So reach out to the people doing the work who are really familiar with the work. That's another way that we can really support harm reduction agencies and um, the people who are doing harm reduction. So, um, oh, the recording is ready. Um, I think we'll send out an email in the next day or two with the recording ready. It should be posted tomorrow, just depending on how quickly I get it posted. So just one more thank you. Um, any cl final closing words, Emily and Lupe? No, thank you, everyone. Yes, yeah, thank you. And um, I hadn't met Lupe before this, and I'm just so pleased to know you now, Lupe. So I'm really grateful for learning from you today. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I feel the same.